TE Talks with Guides is a weekly podcast for lovers of history, travel, and all things Italian. Welcome back to TE Talks. This is Rob Allen. Hello, everybody. Here I am uh, doing our wonderful podcast where we are going to have lovely conversations with many of the guides who work with through Eternity Tours and sometimes even staff members. Today, we have a great guest. We have Thomas joining us. Hey, Thomas. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. How are you today? Doing all right. I'm liquored up, so. Oh, that's good. I am now, of course, uh, an ambulance is driving by the, uh, the office, but we'll just keep it in. It's fine. Could you hear that? Did you hear the ambulance? Yeah. Oh, well. It's that's fine. right. We're in a city. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to be going through the city. So today, I am so excited to talk to you uh, about the grand tour. But first of all, let's just give an introduction for yourself. I know we've done a pre-recording of, of uh, from Charlemagne uh, in the Middle Ages, which will eventually come out, but we're gonna be doing this one first. So tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, and how long have you been working with uh, Through Eternity Tours? Well, uh, I've been in and out of, of Italy for, for 30 years. I've I've lived in Rome now for the last 15, but I'm originally from Central Florida, which is mm -hmm. where I started studying history. Mm -hmm. And then I continued studying history in France, where I also studied art history, and then wrapped things up at the archaeology department at La Sapienza, Rome's 700-year-old university. But the whole 15 years that I've been here in Rome, I worked with Through Eternity. I set up the interview before I left the States, I was living in New Haven at the time and uh, arrived here and the rest, as they say. Is history. There is we go. Uh, yeah, I very much remember your uh, interview with us. I even think I talked about in the last podcast about Caravaggio and the red cloth that would go through with Judith and Holofernes. But I, I will always say, I think that you have a great gift of being a storyteller and being able to take uh, an immense amount of history and weave it in with different stories of characters um, in a way where I was like, well, got to bow down to Thomas because he just does this so beautifully, which I think has always helped. Uh, because you get also into the philosophy and the ideas of things. You go into yeah. you, you go into like a profound deepness, um, which doesn't turn people off at all. In fact, it gets them very much engrossed in it. I mean, you're not just trying to spark people's imaginations. It's like you've opened up a book and they kind of fall into this story that you create for people. And I think. If anybody kind of looks at TripAdvisor, uh, they can see a lot of how they really enjoyed what you've done. And that is why, you know, a, a time period that I find very, very interesting that, you know, we kind of touch upon a little bit when we're doing tours, but I thought it would work really well for you. And that's why I invited you to uh, create a grand tour, uh, virtual tour uh, that we have online. Uh, about Rome, which of course is going to cover some of the beautiful fountains and piazzas of of Rome. So I kind of wanted to talk about it so that people can get an idea, you know, with these virtual tours, they've been so wonderful because they really allow us to recreate with images and live storytelling um, what things were like and we can get to be specialized with them. Yeah. So uh, how did you find getting that challenge, like realizing it? What was it like for you when I said, Oh, Thomas, can you do this for me? Were you happy? Or were you like, oh gosh, what am I going to do? <laughs> am I supposed to be honest? Yes. We're getting to the truth here. <laughs> you know, because you, you had suggested, you know, to do something that kind of features the Spanish steps and, and, and the Trevi Fountain. Mm -hmm. And my, my first thought was a uh, good idea because there's interest because generally the People are interested in first in the things that they already have some familiarity with, mm -hmm. something that at least they've heard of, they know of. So, you know, there's an easy, quick connection. And then they'll learn a lot more, but that, that first connection with something that they've seen or heard of or aware of. Um, but my, my, my second thought was, uh, what am I going to say for an hour on the Spanish steps and the Trevi Fountain? I mean, usually finding enough to say is not my problem. But I thought <laughs> I still need to be uh, interesting, engaging, informative. And, and 
the more I began, I thought, well, like anything else, start digging, mm. start looking and start thinking about how I would organize it. And as I began taking those steps, I kind of thought, well, both the Spanish steps and the Trevi Fountain, just as, you know, sort of poles, anchors on either end of this particular geographic area, come from the same period of history. Uh, a period of history that was certainly English speaking world, um, known in Rome as, as the, the time of, of the Grand Tour. Now it extends earlier than that as well, but you know, really the, the 18th century and into the very early 19th century was kind of the height of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's when I thought, well, let's organize it in that way. Could have, then I was able to sort of try, create a triangle within a geographic triangle within the city with the Piazza del Popolo in the north and then the Spanish steps in the southeast and the Trevi Fountain in the southwest of that particular triangle. Uh, the, the neighborhood itself dates to an earlier time. I mean, they start laying out the plan in the early 16th century. Mm -hmm. And then so much of it is really built up besides some fabulous palaces and monastic installations and churches in the 16th century, much of it is, is actually built in the 17th century. Uh, and then uh, this kind of really corresponds to the, to the dramatic rise of uh, international tourism, for lack of a better word. Sure. And it's Prince, uh, Queen Elizabeth I who really starts that, decides that her young aristocratic noblemen, and I do mean young, I'm talking in their early 20s, many of them, uh, needed to get them some culture on the continent and even supported by their own family money, but also even by government funds, sent off for not months, but even years at a time mm -hmm. uh, as young men uh, to explore. Principally, the idea was the ancient ports of call along the Mediterranean. And the idea was it all culminated in, in Rome. And so that's already beginning in the very late 1500s. And then the French follow suit. And then it becomes even larger, the Germans and the Dutch and the Poles and those from the Baltic states and Scandinavia. Fascinating. So it became quite a, a, a big uh, a phenomenon, really. And it was in this neighborhood that most of those people stayed for their time in Rome. And we're talking people who were spending you know, nine months or, or longer in Rome alone. So they weren't just renting, uh, they, they weren't just you know, renting a room, they were renting a flat or sometimes even even more space. Of course, they were bringing their servants with them as well. Um, yeah. I just want to give a little sidebar to this because you know, we started out with a very interesting, I mean, I'm already engrossed what you're saying. I never realized about Queen Elizabeth, of course, being kind of the catalyst of this. That's fascinating to me. Um, very helpful for me when I'm going to be doing tours. But aside from that, uh, just as a sidebar yesterday, uh, with a, a marketing meeting with Connor and, and Pips and Dylan that uh, Connor apparently said that he always had to warn Pips whenever he puts, uh, on a regular basis, we have photographs of the Trevi Fountain. Why? Because they get the most traction out of anything. So they get the most comments. Now, one of the jobs that Pips is doing is responding to people. So she has to be ready to invest a large amount of time because we also get an enormous amount of comments on this, uh, this, this, this thing, even though people have seen it again and again, it's just so dramatic to people. Now, I love the fact that, you know, the concept of the Grand Tour is kind of the glue together. And also uh, Piazza del Popolo, I love that you are starting there because that's one of my, my favorite places as a starting point uh, in Rome. I think it's, it's a wonderful idea. And I bet- It's what most people saw first. Exactly. The vast majority of people were coming into those Northern gates. I bet, you know, once you then started to think about it, you said to yourself, how am I going to talk about these things for, two, uh, for an hour? And then I thought, I bet you probably were thinking, how am I going to be able to fit all this in within an hour? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, please continue. Let's say you have the nobility. Oh, and another thing, you know, for me, before even coming to Europe, I loved merchant ivory films. I'm, I'm yeah. sure you're familiar with. Room you know, with a oh, view. A Room with a View, of course, and I also- Where Angels Fear to Tread. Where Angels Fear to Tread, but Morris, for me, of course, oh, yeah. was yeah, a big yeah. deal. I remember, uh, oh gosh, yeah. the actor, who was it? He was in um, Four Weddings and a Funeral. Oh God, you know who I'm talking about. He's well, Simon very, Callow. 
Not Simon Callow, no. Yeah, he's but the, the guy other guy, the younger guy. Um, yeah. Oh God, no. I'm good. I'm looking at his face. Uh... Hugh Grant. Hugh Grant. Yes. Anyway, Hugh Grant. You know, he was getting himself into trouble, having a relationship with a man, and so he goes off on his grand tour, and they show him walking by temples, of course, with this lovely. Um, Panama hat and you know I mean it just that really kind of sparked my idea of getting to go to Italy as well uh it's kind of the whole fascinating thing that the British you know were making uh jokes about it Maggie Smith's like well don't worry if we can't find him a husband in, in Downton Abbey she's saying there's always nobility in Italy we can always get her married off to some Italian uh noble you know so there was this kind Chance of, April is another one Oh yeah, and China. I mean, a lot of these were really big in the '90s, and and you know, and then I ended up moving to Italy in 1997. So, yeah, I mean, this this romantic idea as well goes back into it. But let's let's get back on track. So, continue. Uh, talk about like entering into Piazza del Popolo or walking down the Via Flaminia to get there. And it's a really dramatic entrance. And keep in mind for for most people. Uh, traveling like this. They'd already been on the road for a couple of years, at least. I say on the road that I don't mean, you know, under hardship. <laughs> no. You know, they're traveling quite comfortably and, and staying for extended period of, uh, of time in the various places. Not the they're, pilgrims. They're, yeah. they're going. Uh, then arriving in, in Rome, the, the Via Flaminia, this ancient road that connects basically Rome to, to Rimini on the mm -hmm. Adriatic coast. Uh, one of the principal grand old highways from ancient times leading into the, in and out of the city. Then right up at the northern at the northern gate, which leads in, into Piazza del Popolo, you want this enormous square. Now, now it's it's a, this massive elliptical space, and it's only been like that since the Napoleonic era, about two hundred sure. years ago. Before there was kind of trapezoidal, still an enormous urban space. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, and you you walk into this space. You've got two churches that are not exactly twin. They're close enough to be fraternal twins, if not necessarily identical. And then this massive obelisk in the middle. That's uh, well, the first great one brought back from Egypt during the reign of of Caesar Augustus mm -hmm. uh, two thousand years ago. And it's been standing in the middle of that square since uh, since the very late fifteen hundreds. So you walk in, it's a theatrical setting. It's like walking into um, the Welcome Center at Disneyland. I mean, you know that you're someplace special, like as though the Vicar of Christ himself is ruling. Well, that's exactly the case. The Vicar of Christ on earth, the Pope, was indeed ruling because Italy, for most of the last 1,500 years, is not a country. It's a peninsula with a bunch of countries on it one of which is the Papal States, mm -hmm. the, the whole central third of the Italian peninsula. Rome's the capital, the Pope's the king. You walk into this space and you know exactly who's in charge uh, and that it is a place that is different to any other place on earth. That's certainly the idea uh, and much of the sort of a, a, a gusto and confidence that comes with the great growth of the Renaissance, economic growth, political growth, and really the rise of what we end up calling the papal monarchy. Mm -hmm. uh, and all of this is represented in architecture and the rational plans of, of, of Renaissance urban design imposed on a city that is nearly 3000 years old. But you, you, know, you just recycle the space and you cut through things and and in that case, in that whole northern part of town, it was sheep and goats and cows and vineyards and olive groves. Uh, with the main drag of what in ancient times, you know, all this called Via Lata, mm -hmm. which becomes Via del Corso. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, in the Renaissance, in the, in the mid 1400s, becomes uh, the scene of a race, uh, a horse race that takes place every evening of, of Carnival, which is that whole week of events leading up to Ash Wednesday uh, and, and the kickoff, you know, Fat Tuesday, Mardi Gras, yep. and, and then Ash Wednesday, which kicks off the 40 days of Lent. And every evening of that, of that week of Carnival, you had this Barbary horse race. And now, since then, 
be it at courts or in racetrack street. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, as people were traveling across their, their two, three years, uh, they had very well-established itineraries. Uh, and uh, keep in mind, this wasn't travel for pleasure. This was travel for formation. Uh, uh, young aristocratic men, initially women come later on too, but young men and women, they learn to dance. Why? Because it's fun? No, because gentlemen and ladies are expected to know how to dance. Mm. It, it's that kind of, of travel. They've got a list of things to see and do. They have to keep travel journals and they're traveling with um, with academic masters, with with tutors, basically. Sure. And often traveling in, in small groups. And uh, they would plan many of their stops around local folk festivals, mm -hmm. Le Sagre, for example. So if uh, I'm thinking of Santo Stefano di Sassagno, uh, a small town up in the mountains, lentils, they do lentils. And every year when the lentils are gathered, they have the festival of the lentils and you eat lentils that are coming out of your ears for a week. But each of these different places, whether it's the, the feast of their patron saint or, or the the, the, the blessing of whatever their agricultural product is. Uh, you have festivals that go along with that. And, and all of these travels were sort of geared to take as much advantage as possible as those kinds of festivals. People wanted to make sure that during carnival, they were in Rome. Interesting now because Venice is the big draw for, yes. for carnival. Mm -hmm. But until the late 19th century, Rome still Rome was the place that most people wanted to be for Cardinal. Uh, no, no offense to Giovanna. Our, <laughs> yeah, she does do a virtual tour yes. about the Carnival, but yes. <laughs> but uh, Rome was the place that they wanted to make sure that sometime during their stay in Rome, Carnival was happening while, while they were here. What a, what a lost opportunity. I always think about that because it seems like, you know, you read about it, it was such a huge deal. Yeah. It was yeah. started by the Venetian Pope, Paul II. Uh, but you know, it at was... least in that in that sort of the iteration that it became best known for, and the Barbary horse race was was one of the principal elements of that. Well, well, in the late nineteenth century, mm -hmm. the, those those were because it was like the running of the bulls in Pamplona, and just as dangerous. He just they just outlawed it, mm -hmm. um, and that kind of was the death knell for for carnival in Rome. It's never been the same since. Wait, who mayors outlawed? every once in a while they try to bring it back. It doesn't come out as that. Who outlawed the horse race, though? I didn't hear that part. The king, Victor Emmanuel, uh, the, second, blah, blah, the first blah. king okay. of the United Italy. Yeah. What a pain. Okay. Well. Okay. So great. So we've established the first place that we're in. You've done a great job describing for us Piazza del Popolo, and you've also done a great job uh, of, of like touching on aristocrats that are coming through. You know, let's say uh, the English. The Germans, the French, etc. Now, there's something else that I've always had difficulty. So I'm gonna ha hopefully have you uh, explain for me why this is, because I kind of have my own bourgeois ideas of certain things. You know, we have the aristocrats, and then you also said that there was kind of the entourage that would go with them, because we also talk about the Romantics. Okay, the Romantic period, which is you know very much coincided with the Grand Tour, and we talk about one of the greatest. Uh, writers of the German language, Goethe, or we talk about Lord Byron or John Keats, yep. uh, Percy Shelley, these writers, these poets. Now, my idea, of course, is like, oh, we always have the struggling writers, uh, struggling artists, you know, dying of tuberculosis. Now, I always got the idea that they were poor. So is it that they were joining these aristocrats or else they were not? Oh, poor? they were not poor. They were not poor. No, no, no. John Keats came from a wealthy family. Lord Byron is well. Lord mm. Byron Shelley was was from a, was a from a, a fairly well-to-do family as well. Shelley and, and Keats not aristocracy, but from well enough, fairly yeah. well-off families nonetheless. Well-educated, you know, they're they're gentlemen, mm -hmm. um, even if they're not nobility. Uh, and um, they didn't always travel. These these people wouldn't always travel with sometimes few attendants. Most of the time, the help was arranged where they, they were going. So you have travel with a few, you know, essential staff. Mm -hmm. In Rome, in, in particular, they were famous for kind of, English in particular, for, for buying packaged deals. 
sure. uh, which included the, their lodging, uh, chef, service staff, culinary staff, uh, uh, carriage and liveried attendants at their beck and call 24 hours a day. But those were all here. Uh, sometimes they would travel with their own <laughs> photographer, painters. More often, they hired them here. And there were people who made their name and were famous, were well known amongst the, those particular traveling circles. And so, oh, you know, you absolutely must have so and so when you go to have your portrait done at Rome. And 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 they would they would often have them uh, mostly pre-done. So you see these images of, of Lord Byron sort of lounging dramatically with the Colosseum behind him, or Byron with a friend as they're looking out surveying things in the distance with the same view of the Colosseum, because the view of the Colosseum is the view of the Colosseum, and they have them all pre-painted, and all the painter has to do is basically Photoshop the individuals in. Fascinating. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a business. It's like it's Edward business. Gibbons lying on a column for the decline in yeah. the Roman Empire. Yes. All right, and uh, the best known of the portrait artists in Rome was Pompeo Battoni. Uh, huh? And this guy's born in 1708. So it, in the 18th century is, is when he's, he's actually already starting in the 1720s uh, and for decades was the go-to guy, most especially for the, for the, the well-to-do Brits who were, who were traveling in Rome, having their portrait done. So he was probably able to become pretty wealthy. Yeah. I never knew this man. So he could charge if he's going to get the aristocrats with supply and demand, right? That's right. Lovely. Yeah. Didn't know quite that. Quite well for himself. Yeah. Gosh. Okay. So then we're going to have to try to find a self-portrait, not a self-portrait, some kind of portrait if there is one of Pompeo Botoni. Oh yeah. There's certainly portraits of, of stuff that that he's done. Uh, portraits that he's done. Uh, People in various settings in the in the homes in which they were they were staying, mm -hmm. uh, and even find some, most especially that a really famous one. I use a few of them in my in my grand tour. Mm -hmm. One particular one of, of Goethe with his distinctive bone white overcloak. Yes, uh, as he's sort of lying with with bits and pieces of ruins around him, and the That's mausoleum of Cecilia Metella in the background. Basically, he's posing right exactly where my apartment is. Really? Oh, yeah. oh that's how you uh, figured it out. Okay, so that's yep. great. That's insane. Yeah. Um, just for people who are listening, just so you guys know, what's a wonderful thing, what we're doing is that we are filming this conversation on Zoom. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to insert images of things that we're talking about. So then you can go subscribe on our YouTube channel and then take a look. You can even go through it quickly. But just fast forward, and you're going to see these figures, these people we're talking about, these places that we're seeing. So I'm, I'm already like thinking in my mind, looking, having fun, really searching for those images of the carnival, uh, the horse races, um, this, this artist that we're talking about, and all these portraits. But let's get back to the story. How about so? Uh, and you know, there's so many funny things, interesting things that we could talk about with. Uh, we, we have a limited time, but you know, I'm thinking, okay, obelisks. I'm gonna to talk to Luca, our local Egyptologist, uh, to talk about the obelisks, or I think the tridents of Rome, meaning the streets, the most famous yeah. one being the one from Piazza del Popolo and the three streets that form a trident, but there are other ones. But let's just say, so from Piazza del Popolo, going down the Via del Babuino, they get to Piazza di Spagna. So tell me a little bit about that area and what the piazza was, what it looked like, and who was staying there. So if you're, you're at Piazza del Popolo with the gates behind you and you're looking down at the largest of the tridents mm -hmm. with Via del Corso, that racetrack street that runs yep. right down the middle. That's been the main drag through the middle of the town since way before Julius Caesar. Mm. And then you've got the one that goes over to the west, right to the riverbanks and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, port near the mausoleum of Caesar Augustus. Mm -hmm. And then to the east, right at the base of the kind of running along the base of the Pinchon Hill is Via del Babuino. Uh, and you have a few things that sort of mark uh, English presence. It, when, keep in mind that when the Pope is the king, Protestant churches don't exist in Rome. It's only when, when the Pope loses his country during the, the process of unification of Italy and 
Rome is the last of the great cities to fall to the unionizing forces in, in September of 1870. Uh, just a few months later, the Americans, the small American colony here, they build a church, a, an, uh, an Episcopalian church. Yes. The first non-Roman Catholic church uh, in, in Rome. And of course, the, 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 the English were like, damn. So right away, they build one. Uh, and those two churches both exist. The American Episcopalian Church is St. Paul within the walls mm -hmm. and an All Saints in, um, in Via del Babuino. And it sticks out like a sore thumb where you have this, these fabulous earth toned stuccoed uh, buildings from the 16th and, and 17th centuries for the most part. And then this big rusty red brick building with very Northern European kinds of spires. And the inside is a real blend of, of dark woods, uh, but also marbles and polychrome stones and, and, and elements with round arches. So you get a real mixture of something that is quintessentially recognizably English. Yes. And at the same time, making sure that you know that you're in Rome. Uh, I think it's such an incredible space where they've used architecture and interior design to create a phenomenal sense of place. Uh, and But uh, the, the fact that it's in that particular neighborhood reflects the fact that that neighborhood was where most English people stayed. Again, it's where most everybody else stayed too, but they're relatively speaking, the, the English in particular, uh, and, and the rest of Britain as well, and most particularly, you know, the Scots uh, and, and more than, but most famously and most recognizably the English uh, and their representation in, in Rome was disproportionately high. So you had, you know, the Dutch and the Scandinavians and everybody else, but there were so many English people living in that neighborhood for extended periods of time all throughout the year that even the English called it the little English corner of, of Rome. And right on Piazza di Spagna, on Spain Square, with all those English people, why is it called Spain Square? Well, because the Spanish embassy is, is, is on one end of that piazza, which is still the Spanish embassy to the Holy See. Yes. Uh, on the other end of the square, as you're facing the steps, which in fact are paid for by the French, uh, built by Italian uh, builders, and the Spanish get the name, they didn't do anything, but their embassy is there, Casanova, when he first arrives in Rome from mm. Venice, which keep in mind at that time is a separate country, the Republic, the, the most serene Republic of Venice, was that this was still the Papal States down here. But he's hosted by a Spanish Cardinal who's effectively serving as the ambassador of, of Spain to, to Rome, uh, and he's 20 years old, gets kicked out because <laughs> he gets caught harboring a runaway teenage girl in his rooms. Oops. Oh dear. So yeah. He does, I guess. <laughs> as, as you do. Um, but later in life, when he's back in Rome, well established now, mm -hmm. he stays in what was the most exclusive hotel in the city. And it's where the diesel store is now. So as you're facing the steps, off to the left of me, there's Babington's, and then there's the, the that little road via del Bottino, which goes straight to the metro. Yep, yep. Building that's right on that corner, you know. That was the most prestigious that, hotel. Wow. That was the most prestigious hotel in Rome. Yeah. That's interesting. That's fascinating. Do you know I actually uh, performed in that the English, the Anglican Church. It's all saints, and yep. I was uh, uh, with the. Um, the vicar, the I guess, who was in charge. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, we did a performance of uh, Much Ado About Nothing. Oh, nice. Itself. Oh my gosh, yeah, it was about, oh, 2000. But then they regularly host um, operatic arias, groups that do mm -hmm. uh, arias from operas, as does uh, St. Paul Within the Walls as well. Both of them do. Yeah, them. I mean, they are fascinating churches, both that and St. Paul's Within the Walls. St. Paul's has that wonderful mosaic by, oh. Uh, and I love it. And not everyone's a fan, but I, I really like, uh, in general, pre-Raphaelite mm. work. But yeah. I understand it's this is all coming out of what's called the you know the the Oxford movement. Mm -hmm. uh, one of a few names for it, coming mm -hmm. out of the second half of the nineteenth century, 
noble young nobleman and, and, and well to do and coming out of out of Oxford mm -hmm. uh, with this idea that the Anglican Church had thrown out the baby of mystery with the bathwater of papism. They didn't want the Pope back, but they kind of resurrect this kind of nosebleed, high liturgical, late medieval idealized drag. Uh, and they, they're, they're, they, these glorious neo-Gothic structures mm -hmm. in, in especially industrial cities of the North where, where people led such difficult, often drab, hard existences but gave them liturgical beauty that they could go in and feel part of something magnificent and gorgeous. And there was music and, and a lot went into that. And that's still so much a part of, of that particular uh, tradition. And I mean, I often say, you know, put me into a thousand year old church or at least one that looks like one mm -hmm. that's got a big organ, enough incense to choke a camel and men in drag. And I am there for that show. The, 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 my, the head comes off of my shoulders and starts floating around in the stratosphere and places like All Saints and, and, uh, and uh, St. Paul within the walls with those spectacular pre-Raphaelite mosaics. Sure. Yeah, I mean, they had a lot of people uh, with a lot of money uh, yeah. being invested to have, to establish these churches. They're finally allowed to do yeah. it because they're gonna make a, a big job of it. Um, that's interesting also how you pointed out because I do very much as uh, a major in theater, I always fell in love with stages, how things are, are they were able to re recreate in a theater, in a stage, in a black box. But then of course, what was my great passion of Italy was the theatrics of the rituals of the architecture because it's not on a stage. It's not blocked in a little black box. It is everywhere you go, you know, and yep. I mean, this is such a wonderful thing, which uh, a wonderful experience for people. I certainly talk about it on my virtual tour, uh, uh, you know, with St. Peter's uh, being illuminated twice a year with candles, you know, I mean, this stuff goes on and it's wonderful that we can recreate it for people by the stories that we tell. Now, let's just uh, finish up because we don't want to spoil it all, but let's let's just get, of course, to the the crown jewel of our discussion today, the Trevi Fountain, which is, of course, not too far away from the Spanish Steps. Tell us. Um, it, it's done the same, more or less the same time mm -hmm. uh, as the steps themselves. Um, that piazza around the Spanish Steps was deliberately left open as a meeting space. A part of that is a misunderstanding, a misreading of, of antiquity. In, in ancient times, religion, was exercised in a very public fashion in these enormous gathering spaces for the throngs of, of people. Pantheon is a perfect example. Mm -hmm. uh, and those spaces uh, in front of or adjacent to temples uh, in ancient times become the piazzas of, of medieval Rome. And so even in the sort of Renaissance planning, and it's a deliberate reference to ancient Rome. Well, Renaissance itself, Renaissance, the French word for rebirth. Rebirth of what? Rebirth of Rome, at first in ideas, ideals, art, architecture, and then quite literally in the city of Rome itself. And they're using their own particular idea, idealized image of antiquity to create uh, modern Rome. And so that, that, that bizarre lopsided butterfly shaped space of Piazza di Spagna, Mm -hmm. It is deliberately left open for that purpose, for, for people not to do, but for people to, to be. The steps get built. It's a French church up on top of the hill, which is why you have uh, money left in a, in a will by a guy who basically served as, as a diplomat in, in Rome for a long time from France. Uh, that combined with some papal money, the steps get built and finally open up in the winter of 1725-26. Uh, and... It's just a, a decade later that mm -hmm. they begin work on the Trevi Fountain. So these are very, very close in time. And, you know, generalizing a little bit, maybe overstating it, but only a bit. Through much of what we call Baroque, I mean, it's church triumphant. Uh, you know, Michelangelo and Raphael are working on their masterpieces in Rome, and Martin Luther comes to town. Nobody knows who mm -hmm. he is when he arrives, but they're gonna. Oh, you know, yeah. uh, six years after his visit, he's got his 95 bullet point temper tantrum nailed to the door of a church in southern Germany. <laughs> kind of a reference point for, 
for sparking off what we end up calling the Protestant Reformation. Europe immerses itself in a bloodbath for a century. Christian killing Christian in the name of the Christ. They all say they represent that on one side is the other. Mm -hmm. But just to pick the year 1600 as a reference point, you got a more or less Protestant Northern Europe, more or less Roman Catholic Southern Europe. Within Catholic Europe, there's revival, reform, a resurgence of pride and faith and identity and the art and the architecture that reflect that are rather different to the idealized elegance and restraint of the Renaissance. Yes. Baroque, it's big, bold, powerful, majestic, emotional, dramatic, theatrical Baroque. Uh, you know, we're right, the Protestants are wrong. We're going to heaven, they're going to hell. God's on the Pope's side, clearly. I mean, all, proof's in the pudding and it's all around us. That's a, a, a rather particular way of creating architecture. By the time you get to the 1730s, uh, oh, Europe's always got plenty to argue about then as now, yeah, but they gonna... weren't killing each other over religion at that point. Sure. And you see something returning to Roman art and architecture that had been missing for a while. Fun, joy, exuberance, and a different kind of scripture attached to it. Mm -hmm. The joy mm -hmm. of my salvation. I am the living water. Drink from me and ye shall thirst no more. Knock, uh, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. Uh, my father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Uh, God's got more blessing to dump on our heads than we even know how to ask for. Oh, you need a little bit of water in the neighborhood? Here, have this in the backyard of a papal palace. It's, it's about that as much as, as, as anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's so much more than even fits in the space. And it's one, of the, it's one of the things that I hear most frequently from visitors from the first time. They've seen images of it. Maybe they've been to Vegas and seen a particular kind of image of it. What they're not prepared for is how massive the thing is compared to the space. It completely dwarfs everything around it. That the square itself had to be chopped off so they could add the pool. The square becomes basically a small, narrow little walkthrough mm -hmm. compared to the space taken up by, by the pool. And it is theatrical, deliberately so. And even the seating uh, that's around it is, is at least part of the idea from, from the very inception, even though it takes a little while to get it done. But it seems like you've got theater seating. Mm -hmm. Well, where's the show? Well, the water is the show. Sure. The spectacle, that's the spectacle, the water, the images, and the whole thing is a celebration of the attributes and, and aspects uh, of water, for all of the iconography, the imagery, the symbolism, the allegory, the metaphor. Exactly. I mean, the whole thing itself is a proscenium stage. It's a proscenium yeah. stage. Yeah. It's it's almost like you could have curtains opening it up, and that the, yeah. the the scenery rises up out of the water, even though it's static. There is movement because of the water itself. Oh yeah, and and not only the water, they've sculpted these various kinds of rocks mm -hmm. with something like. 300 different kinds of botanical life very carefully and accurately uh, depicted, all carved in this travertine, uh, travertine stone. So it almost looks like the building is growing out of, of the stone. Sure. It's uh, sort of the opposite of you know, the second law of thermodynamics that things move from a state of order to a state of disorder. And here we have uh, order coming out of disorder or we have something growing out of dead stone. I mean, it is the very act of creation itself, covered in life. That's and fascinating that's the point. how you, you point that out because it makes me think because in that time period, the monuments, which we're getting to have be more important, archeology span is not yeah. still coming in, that's in the 1800s, this is done in the yeah. 1730s, but the Colosseum and other all these other ruins are covered with plants, they're covered yeah. with these things. So. Maybe that's an idea that's really interesting about the plants uh, on it. I mean, there's so many fascinating details. Uh, thank you for giving us just a little taste of it. And I'm sure people can learn a lot more about it if they want to follow your uh, virtual tour, the Grand Tour. And that also, you know, in this week, that is all Grand Tour and City Center, because we're going to have a video being premiered on Friday, uh, walking through the center. But we are going to also show your lovely uh, TE Walks Live that we did on Facebook, on YouTube, about you walking from Piazza del Popolo to Piazza di Spagna and uh, eventually getting to the Trevi Fountain. Now, before we kind of conclude, we're gonna do a new segment 
I mentioned to you a bit before, let's just say we are doing our TE travel tips because you guys have dealt with many, many different clients. You are also experts in travel yourselves as we are here. So if I was gonna ask you, what would you like to leave as a TE through eternity travel tip to potential travelers to Rome or Italy? Oh, there's so many. I think uh, one of the first that comes to mind is, is one that I, I talk about quite frequently, leave time for nothing. Uh, and, and people will often say, well, I, I've got a limited amount of time. I'm going to plan everything to make the best use of my time. And this kind of turns them into machines. And, and they often regret it when they go home because then everything's just a blur. On the other hand, you've got folks who say, oh, I just prefer to kind of wing it, take it as it comes and follow my fancy. Often your fancy will lead to waiting for three hours in a queue. There yeah. are things you want to plan ahead of time. Uh, plan your transport tickets. You don't want to say, I want to be in Florence uh, by dinner time, and then all the trains are sold out. Mm -hmm. uh, so plan your transport ahead of time. Book your tours well in advance. Sure. Um, and any events, shows, things like that. Uh, plan those ahead of time. Purchase your tickets ahead of time. Um, it, it makes the, it, it just means you spend a lot less time needlessly waiting in queues or being frustrated because you can't get in. Uh, and then in your daily itinerary, leave time to do absolutely nothing. First of all, build in long periods of time. I mean, you know, a really long lunch, like 45 minutes. No, no, no. Well, really long lunch, like at least an hour and a half. Uh -huh. Build it, you're gonna need the time to sit, relax, catch your breath and enjoy what you're eating rather than just trying to get it in and on to the next thing. Uh, build in just blank holes in your afternoons. You can use them to nap, shop, stroll, sit in a piazza and have gelato, uh, watch the world go by, live like Romans for just a, for just a little while, do that each day. Uh, you'll go home with not just photographs or souvenirs, but with memories and experiences. It makes a huge difference. Gives you time to sort of digest what it is that you're ingesting. Exactly, you know, there's always that, I always say to, you know, tour, but also have time to relax and, and take it all in to experience it, experience the meals, experience walking on your own and not have everything regimented. That's a very uh, great point, Thomas. And that's the thing that we at Through Eternity also love to help people out is planning, getting the tickets, you know, getting the trains, making those reservations. Uh, and that's what we're here for. We love to help people out and make those arrangements because we want, you know, their experience to be effortless and not worrisome and you know, have to deal with some kinds of the bureaucracy or going up to a place like the Vatican, not realizing that if you don't get your tickets, you're gonna wait for an hour or two to get into a site or the Coliseum or other places. Or dealing with the Trenitalia website. Oh my God, yeah, no. Just let us do that for you. Yeah, exactly. Just let us do that for you. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, Thomas, as always, I have learned an enormous amount. I am always astounded by your ability to take so many things, uh, you know, the portrait artist, the liturgical sense in the creation with architecture and the joy that it would bring to people. Um, so many different things are always so helpful for me. Uh, very enjoyable. I know that we could talk for hours uh, to continue this. We do have to keep this short, but it was uh, such a pleasure. And I know that we're going to be having you back for more podcasts later on. Great. Thanks. I look forward to it. All right, guys. Thanks again for joining our TE Talks podcast and look forward to speaking to you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to our TE Talks with Guides. We have a new episode every Wednesday. Please subscribe to get an alert when each podcast comes out. Rate us and tell people how you enjoyed it and share it on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. Most importantly, if you enjoyed it, send us a feedback about the show. Also, if you are curious about what some of these people and places we talked about look like, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel and watch the video on this podcast where we have inserted special images for you to further enjoy the story.